Thank you for joining us today. I'm glad you're watching because we're about to meet a man, a mighty man in a hopeless situation. He had every advantage, but as we'll discover, it wasn't enough. In a way, his story reminds me of Corey Tinboom, the Dutch watchmaker whose family helped nearly 800 Jews escape the Nazi Holocaust. By exercising their Christian faith in desperate times, they too found themselves in a hopeless situation. Betrayed to the Nazis by a fellow Dutch citizen, Corey's entire family was eventually imprisoned. She survived the concentration camps and later started a worldwide ministry. But out of that horrific experience would emerge these incredible words. If you look at the world, you'll be distressed. If you look within, you'll be depressed. If you look at God, you'll be at rest. What did Corey know or possess that enabled her to pen such an encouragement, rising as it did from a season of deep darkness? Perhaps our opening song holds the answer. In Christ alone. <laughs>
power of hell, no scheme of man, can ever pluck me from God's hand. Father, I thank you that we're safe and secure in your hands. I thank you that you love us, that you care for us, and that you want us in return to love you, to be devoted to you. I pray in these next few moments that you would speak into each of our lives, that we'd be receptive to what you have for us today. And Lord, that you would just encourage the saints and draw people closer to you this morning, especially during these difficult days. We love you. We thank you for your love for each of us. I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. If you have your Bibles nearby, and I trust you do, turn with me to 2 Kings and chapter 5. Before introducing our mighty man, allow me to set the stage. The divided kingdoms of northern Israel and southern Judah have been in existence for about 90 years. Jeroboam, or excuse me, Jehoram or Joram, Israel's ninth king, is reigning. To the north, his nemesis, Ben-Hadid II, king of Aram or Syria, has banned his marauders from invading Israel. Why? Well, his change of heart followed on the heels of a failed attempt to capture Elisha, God's prophet, who'd been exposing Syria's war room tactics to Jehoram. Because of divine blindness, Elisha was able to lead Ben-Hadid's army into the very center of Samaria, Israel's capital, where their eyes were then opened. But instead of taking them captive, Jehoram fed them a feast, according to Elisha's counsel, and sent them back to Syria. What we're about to read occurs during a temporary period of peace between these two nations. We pick it up in verse 1 of 2 Kings and chapter 5. Now Naaman, commander of the army of the king of Syria, was a great and honorable man in the eyes of his master, because by him the Lord had given victory to Syria. He was also a mighty man of valor, but he was a leper. What do we know of Naaman? To begin with, he was to Syria what General Storman Norman Schwarzkopf was to the U.S. during Desert Storm. In fact, the most popular chariot sticker during General Naaman's command was Paven Naaman. He was cherished by Ben-Hadid and competent in his abilities, though certain victories were due to divine intervention. Yes, God will use pagan nations to accomplish his will. Naaman was a leader of men. His name literally means delight, pleasant, or agreeable, which only increased his popularity among the troops. According to verse 1, he was courageous, a mighty man of valor, or valiant warrior. You never wanted to encounter Naaman on the battlefield. And yet for all his accomplishments, he was plagued by a terrible disease, leprosy. A man respected by all and feared by foes was afflicted with this infectious and often fatal disease. He was, according to our text, a leper. Like coronavirus, leprosy is no respecter of persons. Naaman had everything going for him, but it wasn't enough. His flesh reminded him daily that he had an incurable disease. He was literally a dead man walking. If he could have exchanged his wealth for his health, he would have. If he could have surrendered his position for a more positive outcome, I'm convinced it would have been done. His physical condition created a hopeless situation, but God had plans for this proud general. Look at verse 2. And the Syrians had gone out on raids. This was prior to the temporary peace accord and had brought back captive a young or little girl from the land of Israel. Naaman's illness wasn't the only tragedy. 
Here we find a nameless girl, maybe 10 or 12, who was forcibly removed from the warmth and security of her home. Her parents, if left alive, were now enduring their worst fear. But imagine the horror their sweet daughter was feeling. Incredibly, without minimizing her pain, we discover a remarkable young lady who, in spite of her circumstance, was faithfully representing Israel's God. In the rest of verse 2, this is what we read. She waited on or served Naaman's wife. In spite of being ripped from her home and all that was familiar, she finds herself in the very household of General Naaman. How did she land that gig? Was she given a choice? Were there interviews with all the wives of the prominent Syrian men? Or was God at work coordinating her care as he fulfilled his greater purpose? Apparently the arrangement, as hard as it was, suited her, for there's no hint of bitterness as we continue to read. Then she said to her mistress in verse three, if only my master were with the prophet who is in Samaria, for he would heal him of his leprosy. How long she's been in the service of Naaman's wife, who certainly bemoaned his distress and despair, we're not told. But it seems long enough to realize that her master's name was appropriate. Though he had leprosy, he was still a pleasant or agreeable individual whose presence was delightful. If either he or his wife had been ill-mannered or abusive, her response may not have been as passionate. But her compassion for Naaman is evident, born, I believe, out of her devotion to Yahweh. Question, have you ever been timid about speaking up for God? Though just a youngster, this daughter of Israel wasn't ashamed to admit to declare her allegiance. Would God, my Lord, were with the prophet that is in Samaria, for he would recover him of his leprosy. The impact of her words on Naaman's wife convinced her, so she conveys the message to her husband who finds no cause for doubt. When our daughters were young, one of them would often use a phrase, I am true, I am true. Whenever we heard those words, we knew she was shooting straight. So upon the earnest confession of this maiden, Naaman steps out. Look at verse four. And Naaman went in and told his master, Ben Haddad, saying thus and thus, said the girl who is from the land of Israel. Could it be? Is such a thing even possible? Remember, Naaman was a great and honorable man in the eyes of his master. So Ben-Hadid's reaction is not surprising. Look at verse five. So the king of Syria said, go now and I will send a letter to the king of Israel. So he departed and took with him 10 talents of silver, 6,000 shekels of gold and 10 changes of clothing. The king did two things. He sent a letter requesting his generals that he would be healed of his leprosy. That's not a small request, is it? And secondly, he donated remuneration. I knew I was going to mess up that word. Remuneration, there it is, for services rendered. And quite a lot, actually, according to today's estimate, multiple thousands, in fact. I wonder to myself as I read this, why would a Gentile king a prestigious military commander and his wife believe and act upon the recommendation of a mere slave girl. Here's why. Her behavior was consistent with her beliefs. Her behavior was consistent with her beliefs. Her faith motivated her to be faithful in a foreign land. Even during adverse circumstances, her desire was to honor God. 
The results speak for themselves. As Warren Wiersbe notes, had she not been a faithful worker in the house, she would not have been an effective witness. Is this true in our lives? Presently, it feels like we're living in a foreign land rather than in America. But are we faithfully representing God to those who don't know him? I hope so. Well, with letter in hand and tribute, Naaman's regal train sets out for Israel's capital. Look at verse 6. Then he brought the letter to the king of Israel, which said, Now be advised, when this letter comes to you, that I have sent Naaman, my servant, to you, that you may heal or cure him of his leprosy. Remove it from him. That's why I've sent him to you. And it happened when the king of Israel read the letter that he tore his clothes and said, Am I God to kill and make a lie that this man sends a man to me to heal him of his leprosy? Therefore, please consider and see how he seeks a quarrel with me. Does the king's reaction shock you? Hardly. But I find it fascinating that he doesn't immediately call for Elisha, the man of God, who performed so many miracles by the hand of God. Was Elisha unknown to him? Not by any stretch. But like King Ahab, his wicked father before him, Jehoram felt no love for Elisha because he was like his mentor, Elijah, who had been a godly thorn in the godless side of his father. At any rate, Naaman's condition is hopeless. So it must have been disheartening to watch Israel's king rend his clothes, signifying great anxiety and distress over Ben Haddad's dispatch. Are you trying to pick a fight with me? Who do you think I am that I can heal your general? Thankfully, Elisha comes to Jehoram's rescue. Look at verse 8. So it was when Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes that he sent to the king, saying, I hear you're having a rotten day. Actually, that's not what he said. Why have you torn your clothes? Please let him come to me, and he shall know that there is a prophet or messenger of God in Israel. Listen closely, and you just might catch the sigh of relief issuing from Jehoram's lips as he sends the sick general to the prophet's abode. Imagine with me for a minute what's going on in Naaman's mind. I have a fatal disease. I've traveled on the advice of a 10 or 12 year old to the land that she grew up in and was taken captive from to those who've actually been my adversaries. I'm here to see a man of God, hoping to be healed. What a moment this must have been in his journey. With a crack of the whip, the creak of leather, and the swirl of dust, your chariot driver brings you to the home of the prophet. Verse 9, then Naaman went with his horses and chariot, and he stood at the door of the house of Elisha. With restrained excitement, the one who commands an army stands before Elisha's door. Naaman may have been a leper, but image still mattered. He fully expected to be met by the prophet himself due to the nature of his situation and standing as Syria's mighty general. What he wasn't prepared for was being greeted by a lowly servant. Verse 10, and Elisha sent a messenger to him, saying, go and wash in the Jordan seven times, and your flesh will be restored to you, and you shall be clean. I don't know about you, but if a prominent public figure or military commander was coming to my home, I'd be gawking out the window and outside to greet him before he ever reached the door. 
So why did Elisha send his servant instead? Two reasons. Number one, Naaman had to learn that rank and riches don't matter with God. He's not impressed by rank or riches. His cure would be the sole result of divine mediation. Wash or dip in the Jordan seven times. Seven being the number of or indication of God's perfect healing, that he was behind it. I mean, what medicinal properties are in muddy water? Second, Naaman needed to understand there was no cleansing virtue in the muddy waters of the Jordan, but only as he acted in faith by responding to God's word. It wasn't enough to believe Elisha's directive the general needed to behave in accordance with it. What would you have done? Look at verse 11. But Naaman became furious and went away and said, Indeed, I said to myself, he will surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and wave his hand over the place and heal the leprosy. I thought there'd be more to this. Modern day miracle workers or faith healers would have produced a bigger show because larger crowds procure greater revenue, but not Elisha. Our text indicates Naaman became furious, which means to crack off, to fly into a rage a strong emotional outburst of anger, especially with men. Turns out the general struggled with pride, as most men do. Look at verse 12. Are not the Abana and the Parpar, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? Could I not wash in them and be clean? Naaman resented being told to immerse himself in the cloudy river when his own country boasted sparkling rivers of crystal clear water. In the New Testament scriptures, Paul writes, for the word or message of the cross is folly to those who are perishing. Why? Because no one does something for nothing. So they resent the message. They reject the message. But to us who are being saved, who are being rescued from sin and future judgment, it is the power of God. It makes sense, confirmed via the spiritual birth that occurs when faith in Christ is exercised. Sadly, as with our general, many follow his example when confronted by God's cure. Look at the rest of verse 12. So he turned and went away in a rage. It's always discouraging when folk turn away from the Lord, especially in light of what the scriptures teach, that all men are infected by the leprosy of sin, which prevents them from enjoying a relationship with God and ultimately entering heaven. Self-cures are out as well, as one Bible teacher observes. Leprosy was not merely a surface eruption. It was deeper than the skin. How like sin. The problem is not on the surface. Deeper than the skin, the problem lies in sinful human nature. The Bible has nothing good to say about the flesh or the old nature because it is the source of so many of our troubles. Sinners cannot be changed by shallow surface remedies. They need to have their hearts changed or transformed. In him, the Lord Jesus, we have redemption or liberation from sin's penalty through his blood. You see, it's the blood of Jesus Christ that is God's remedy for our sin. The forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. And this divine cure is received in exactly the same way Naaman acquired his by faith and faith alone. For as many as receive Christ, 
writes the Apostle John, to them he gives the right to become children of God to those who believe in his name. But you know, the decision is a personal one with two possibilities. First, you can turn away like the thief on the cross who while hanging next to Jesus blatantly mocked him or like the rich young ruler who walked away grieved because he loved riches more than Christ. That's one reaction. The second one is this. You can humble yourself before God as Naaman eventually did. Look at verse 13. And his servants, Naaman's attendants, came near and spoke to him and said, my father, a term of respect, they, they love this man. My father, if the prophet had told you to do something great, would you not have done it? We've watched you. We've seen you in the battlefield, the mighty deeds you're able to pull off. I mean, how much more then when he says to you, just wash and be clean? Won't you reconsider? So Naaman went down and dipped seven times in the Jordan according to the saying of the man of God, and his flesh was restored like the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. From an earthly perspective, Naaman's condition was hopeless, but his heavenly cure was miraculous, not to mention his conversion. What do I mean? Well, he ventured from Syria as a leper and lost soul in search of healing. He would exit Samaria as a changed man, not just physically, but mentally, emotionally, and volitionally. First, he had a change of mind, verse 15, then he returned to the man of God, he and all his aides, and he came and stood before him, and he said, indeed, now I know that there is no God in all the earth except in Israel, if only Jehoram, the king of Israel, would acknowledge the same reality. Naaman now realized there were no other gods, small g, besides the God of Israel and Elisha, for none could heal as he had done. Secondly, he had a change of heart. Look at the rest of verse 15. Now, therefore, he said to Elisha, please take a gift from your servant. But Elisha said, as the Lord lives before whom I stand, I will receive nothing. And he urged him to take it, but Elisha refused. Where once Naaman's heart was cluttered with pride and anger, now it's consumed with kindness and gratitude. Elisha, true to his devotion and desire to glorify God, refused any reward. He was not a prophet for hire. He would not accept any trinket or tailored outfit. How unlike many of today's tele-evangelists who repeatedly ask their listeners to donate their money so they might consume it themselves. Finally, Naaman had a change of will. Look at verse 17. So Naaman said, then if not, please let your servant be given two mule loads of earth. For your servant will no longer offer either burnt offering or sacrifice to other gods, but to the Lord. In essence, Naaman was saying, I will no longer worship false gods. I will only worship the living Lord. He recognized the error of offering sacrifices to lifeless idols. So he chose instead to serve God, the God of heaven. I'd say his conversion was complete. He was a changed man, both within and without, though his plans for the native soil of Israel are questionable. Most believe he intended to build an altar to the God of heaven once he got back to his own land. Look at verses 18 and 19. Yet in this thing, he has a request of Elisha. May the Lord pardon your servant. When my master goes into the temple of Rimon, to worship there, and he leans on my hand, this must have been one of Naaman's official duties to ben Haddad. and I bow down in the temple of Rimen with my master. When I bow down in the temple of Rimen, may the Lord please pardon your servant in this thing. Then Elisha said to him, go in peace. 
So he departed from him a short distance. Elisha neither approves nor disapproves Naaman's request, but he simply wishes him peace as he travels back to his own country and king. So we're going to leave it at that. But in recognition of Naaman's faith and as a rebuke of Israel's unbelief during Jesus' earthly ministry, he, Jesus, actually references this account and one other in Luke's gospel while addressing a skeptical synagogue. In chapter 4 of Luke, he mentions how in the days of Elijah, there were many widows in Israel, but to none of them was Elijah sent except a Zarephath, to a Gentile woman who was a widow. Then he adds this, and there were many lepers in Israel in the time of the prophet Elisha, and none of them was cleansed, but only Naaman the Syrian. Neither one belonged to the nation of Israel, but both were in God's sights. The significance of Jesus highlighting a nameless widow and a mighty man cannot be overstated. Whether known or unknown, a man of valor or a vulnerable woman, God is not willing that any should perish or reach the end of their lives without experiencing his cure for the leprosy of sin. Neither Naaman nor the widow of Zarephath initiated their rescue. God took the first step by reaching out to them via his messengers, whether prophet or little girl. I don't know where you're at this morning, but God does. Is he calling your name? Are you listening? Jesus' disciples once asked, who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? That's a debate they had quite frequently. In response, Jesus called a little child, set him in their midst, and said these words. Assuredly, I say to you, unless you are converted, turned or changed in your way of thinking, and become as little children with childlike humility and faith, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. So if Jesus is beckoning to you today, don't allow pride to keep you from coming to him, as it almost kept Naaman from dipping into the Jordan. Instead, consider this. What can wash away, what will wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus.